Well, while a few others are gathering in, the prayer meeting's still going. I just left a little bit earlier. Just remain seated. We'll sing a few hymns together. Uh, we'll go to 286, 286. Um, we'll sing the first and uh, the last verses, the first and last verses of 286, Would You Be Free From Your Burden of Sin. Five hundred and ninety five over a few pages, five nine five, the sands of time are sinking. We'll sing verses one, two, and four, if the men at the back for the screen, if you're using the hymn book, verses one, two, and four, please, of five eight or five nine five. Time for another one, maybe two. Number 89, the beautiful hymn. My Lord has garments so wondrous fine, and mere their texture fill. Its fragrance reach to this heart of mine, with joy my being thrills. We'll sing the first uh, two and the last verse of number 89. Verses 1 and 2 and 4.
across the way slightly there. I was going to really sing that out, but I realised I was going too fast, and you were at a slower pace than I was. So, uh, I'm not saying I was the only one in tune, that's for sure, uh, but uh, it's good singing, tremendous hymn, and I think maybe we could just get these hymns off to a fine tune. We could really lift the roof with beautiful hymns like that. 366. And as you're turning to the place, we'd just like to give a very warm welcome to all who have gathered with us here on the Sunday evening Gospel Hour. We're delighted to see you all. We welcome you in our Saviour's name. Also to those that are joining on the online stream, again, we thank you for your interest and your support and your encouragement. We pray the Lord will bless you and your family as well. It's lovely to have folks with us tonight and different ones gathering. If you're here for the first time or you're returning again, we're glad to see you and we welcome you in the Saviour's name. It's good to see uh, James and Joanna Wiley and um, they have Daniel with them and they have Joshua no Ruth I take it okay uh, she's, she's not left in Balamine on her own so she's she's being looked after she's not home alone but it's lovely to have you back again and worshipping with us we pray the Lord will continue to bless you and your family at this time 366 then and we'll stand after the first note get ready for the introductory key <laughs> For a moment, someone was going to start another verse of that hymn, tell you the truth, and it would be nice if you feel liberty to do that. I don't think the session have a rule. Sure they don't, I'll ask the clerk here. I don't think there is a rule, uh, so if you want to lead us in another verse of a hymn, if it touches your heart, if it blesses your soul. Now, you say to me, I'll get off on the wrong note. Well, there you are. You're defeated before you start. Uh, but believe me, even if you did, there's enough here. We'll get you back on the right note. Uh, so if you ever feel led of the Spirit of God and you enjoy the hymn and you really want to praise the Lord, then don't you be afraid just to uh, start off on another verse of this hymn and uh, we'll join with you. I can be, you can be sure of that. If nobody else does, I certainly will. And there'll be two of us making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Father in heaven, it is with joy that we can truthfully say that we have tasted and we have seen that the Lord is good. And blessed is the man even the woman, young person, boy or girl, that trusteth in him. We thank thee, Lord, that many years ago for some of us, many, many years ago, 
Lord, over 40 years, we got a drink of the living water. We thank thee, Lord, we have never thirsted again. We have never thirsted for, Lord, the springs of this old world. We thank thee, Lord, that we have never thirsted again for the things, Lord, of the flesh and sin. And while we've been tempted and sometimes fall, nevertheless, Lord, we have had a drink. And Lord, we've been spoiled for the world. We rejoice in that. And Lord, having tasted and having drunk from that fountain of life, having come to Christ at his invitation and call, and having received from him, Lord, that Lord life-giving stream, Lord, we thank thee that the Spirit has been with us, and Lord, he has been in us, and Lord, he has been, Lord, as the rivers of water swelling up within us. And we rejoice, O God, that we have, Lord, drawn the bucket from the well of thy great salvation. And we thank thee we are drinking still at the streams of living water. And Lord, we thank thee that, Lord, we have been satisfied with Christ. We thank thee he is enough. He is sufficient. We don't need anything else when we have Christ. We have all in all. We have life with a capital L. We have life eternal. We have life more abundant. We not only have quantity, everlasting life, but we have quality, abundant life in Christ. And we rejoice, our Father, that he is the life. We thank thee there's no life outside the Lord. There's only spiritual and eventually a death, eternal death. But we bless thee, Lord, for a sense of the divine presence. We thank thee for mercy seen and unseen, and for the glorious gospel of thy grace. For God so loved the world that he gave. And Lord, we think of what the Lord gave. He gave of himself on the cross. He gave himself to untold sorrow and suffering at the place called Calvary. It was there for us. He suffered, bled, and died. We thank thee that on the third day he rose again. He's alive forevermore. And now the highest place that heaven affords is his by sovereign right. And we worship thee, Father, through the eternal spirit for thine only begotten and well-beloved Son. We thank thee for the blood of the cross. We thank thee for the shed blood of the Lamb. We rejoice in righteousness given over to our account and we thank thee that for the joy of thy salvation. We thank thee it is well with our soul and we ask that you will help us to rejoice in the Lord always. And as Paul said and again, in case we missed it, to emphasize it again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand and we're not to be careful for anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving thanksgiving. We are to let our requests be made known unto thee, and then the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So bless tonight, Lord, in the gospel hour. Grant that you will awaken and arrest and bring precious souls to repentance and faith in Christ, both in the house and the online ministry. Lord, even if sermons and messages are listened at a later time, and even if they're listened and downloaded tonight or tomorrow, we pray, O oh God, you will speak to hearts, Lord, troubled souls. And if there's someone listening in this evening, Lord, whoever it is, just at home or elsewhere, out of Christ, without a Savior, may they come under conviction right now, where they know that we're praying for them. And the gospel of God's grace is for them, if they'll come and receive Christ as their Savior too. So hear our prayer tonight. Pour out of thy spirit and Gracious Father, be pleased to be with us. Remember, Lord, this service and many others like it across our province. We pray for thy presence and blessing. Remember thy servant as she comes to minister in song. We thank thee for her. We bless thee, Lord, for the gifts and talents that she has. And we rejoice she employs him in the service of the master. And we pray that as she would sing the gospel tonight, that thou wouldst be with her and bless those messages to all of our hearts. And we pray, Father, for the reading of Holy Scripture, the preaching forth of the word of Christ and the gospel, that sinners would be converted and the Lord's name honored and glorified. So continue with us now, comfort those who mourn, minister continually to the sick, and grant, Lord, you'll hear and answer prayer in Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen.
I should have mentioned, good to see our brother Brian Jackson in, and Pat, and uh, we have been praying for you, as you know, and continue to remember you in prayer. We're delighted to have with us tonight our sister Charlotte Cahey from Port of Ogie. She's no stranger to the congregation here, and we're going to ask her to come now. She's going to bring her first two messages in song, and then we'll hear from her a little later on in the service. Thank you. I just want to thank you for having me here tonight um, to sing. I normally do this while everyone's singing so they don't hear it. There we go. <laughs> the first piece I'm going to sing um, brings us to the cross.
Well, it's lovely to see a gift and a talent that is given by God to an individual used for his eternal glory. And we do thank our sister for bringing us to the cross when I survey the wondrous cross upon which the Prince of Glory died, bringing us to Calvary. I don't think there's a greater song you could sing, but it centers on Christ and the cross, his finished work, his sorrow, his suffering, his anguish, and then reaching that high note at the end, uh, with everything that this world could ever give you, uh, you count it with loss in the light of his cross. I wonder tonight, do you know Christ? Do you have his salvation? Have you been to Calvary? And then we were thinking in that last piece of the faithfulness of our God, how good the Lord has been to every one of us. There's not a man or woman, young person, boy or girl present tonight, but you cannot say the Lord hasn't been good to you. He has. He's been so good, so good. And God's so loved, and he's full of grace and mercy. And when you consider his faithfulness, you could have been in hell tonight. You could have been lost tonight. You could have been in torment tonight. You could have been languishing, perishing, in a lonely, dark sinner's hell. God has kept you alive. And many of us he has saved by his grace, and we'll never be there. And he has given you another opportunity, a wonderful invitation to come and trust him. So we do thank our sister very much indeed for those messages in song. We will hear from Charlotte a little later on. I've asked her to sing three tonight because she's very hard to get booked, let me tell you. And the reason why we had a a meeting, uh, Easter convention, or, or the Easter meeting last night, or last week, singing. Uh, Charlotte was only able to fit in this date for us, so we just had to uh, go with her diary, and we'll be, God willing, booking her uh, for a uh, future time as well. I'm going to ask our clerk of session, Mr. Alistair, if he'll come forward, please. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Thank you. Well, it's good to see everyone here again tonight. The floor of the church well filled up. Uh, we do welcome you in the Saviour's name. We're glad to see each and every one of you out at the Lord's house this evening. I uh, do remember our meetings during the week. Uh, Tuesday evening, 8 p.m., our prayer meeting, time of Bible study. Uh, Friday, uh, remember our seniors. Uh, it is our monthly seniors meeting uh, on Friday morning. Uh, commencing at 11.30 a.m. And the Reverend David McMillan will be the speaker at that event. Uh, do remember as well, if you haven't already done so, if you're able to come, do add your name to the list there in the hall of the church. Uh, and that, of course, is for catering purposes, uh, so that there'll be enough lunch uh, for everyone who comes. Uh, so remember to do that. This will be the last opportunity you'll have uh, then also on Friday, the Youth Fellowship at 8 p.m. and the Men's Prayer Meeting at 10 p.m. 
Uh, next Lord's Day, the service is the normal times, a quarter past ten, the Sunday school and Bible class, uh, half past eleven and seven p.m., uh, the two services, and then uh, being the second Lord's Day of the month, uh, it is the young adults um, rally for this particular area of North Down, uh, and that commences at 8.45, uh, and the venue this month is our Newton Ards Church. So do keep that in mind. Uh, before going over there, young adults uh, from our own congregation here, do remember there is a short choir practice uh, for you uh, to make preparation for participation uh, at our youth mission uh, that will be coming up in the month of June. So remember that as well. Uh, also, being the second Lord's Day of the month, uh, it is our missionary offering. And this month, that offering will be going to the work of Let the Bible Speak. Uh, can I mention as well uh, that uh, Tuesday week, Tuesday the 16th of April, there will be a special deputation meeting uh, when our brother, uh, Mr. Glenn Hamilton, uh, will be along uh, on deputation. As you know, our brother will be going out to... Um, I was going to say Uganda, I think it's oh, Kenya. Kenya, yeah, I think it's Kenya. <laughs> uh, so uh, in the not too distant future, and he's making preparations for that. Uh, so do remember that special deputation service. Uh, as I mentioned this morning, I'll not dwell upon it uh, to the same extent this evening, uh, but we are holding session and committee elections in four weeks' time. Uh, on Tuesday the 30th of April. So do keep that in mind. We have on display there the list of communicant members. We also have a list of the men from the congregation who are el eligible to be elected. Uh, do uh, have a look at those, uh, please, uh, as you leave, if you haven't already done so. And I'll be mentioning, I'm required to mention this, I think, uh, each Lord's Day for the next three Lord's Day, four in total. Uh, so we'll be coming back to that week after week. Thank you. Well, we do thank our brother very much indeed for making those announcements, subject as always to the divine will of the Lord. Before our sister Charlotte comes again to bring her final message in song, we'll turn to the hymn 394, 394. We're going to sing the first two verses of this hymn. We'll stand, please, as we worship. 394. ask her sister Charlotte to come now and bring her final message in song. Thank you.
that the words in this last song will really speak to somebody tonight. Um, I'll just read the last chorus here. This is the power of the cross. Son of God slain for us. What a love, what a cost. We stand forgiven at the cross.
You know, the cross is the central message of the entire Bible. If you were to take your Bible tonight and you were to examine it, even as uh, an atheist or a critic, uh, then you would have to conclude that the central message of your Bible is the cross. The Old Testament, look forward to that great event with many of its ceremonies and rites and rituals and prophecies, all pointing to the time when the Son of God would leave heaven, come down into this world of ours. And the New Testament, uh, it looks back on that historical event uh, with its Gospels explaining and its epistles expounding the meaning of the cross. And I want to tell you, every single sinner who has ever been saved by God's grace or has entered into heaven at death or will ever enter heaven even at the Lord's return have all been saved at the cross. The cross is, I believe, uh, the most powerful, positive, and yet personal message could ever fall upon human ears. I wonder tonight, have you been to the cross? The cross is the ground and hope for believers. It's the very joy of heaven forevermore. Everything centers around Christ and his cross. And friends, listen to me. You've heard the message, the power of the cross. If you miss the cross, you're lost. Because the way of the cross leads home. It's sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. And I wonder, have you been to the cross tonight? Are you saved? Have you been to Calvary? Have you trusted in the finished work of that cross? Are you resting in the power of the blood of that cross? Tell me, have you received the Savior who was on that cross? The power of the cross. If I was to say nothing else tonight, there's been enough here in that final message and in those messages to take us to the cross, the place where sin has been punished, the place where sinners are pardoned, because it's the place where salvation was purchased. That's my first sermon, by the way. I could preach on the cross right now. And after that ministry and song, if someone couldn't get up and preach after that, they might as well put on their coat, that's me I'm talking about, and put their glasses in their top pocket and their pen in the inside pocket and take the hymn book and just head out through the church. Uh, we're delighted to hear those messages and song. Thank you very much indeed for ministering to us. I'm getting blinded here by this blind, but it's all right. Nobody try to get up and fix it or anything like that. I'll just stand back a wee bit and that'll give you concentration here in the house. John chapter 7, as we close out the gospel hour. John chapter 7. And I uh, just want to read uh, two verses for you uh, from John chapter 7. The verses 37 and the verse 38. Let us all hear the word of the Lord. John chapter 7, verse 37 and 8. And it's there we read these words of Christ when he said, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly, shall flow rivers of living water. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy presence already, for the special ministry and song, for the reading now of the text of Scripture, and for the preaching and hearing of the Word of God. I ask, Lord, for thy blessing. I pray personally for myself now that thou wouldst cleanse me afresh in the Saviour's blood, the blood of that cross that we were listening, Lord, being sung. I pray, Lord, you will wash and make me clean and grant, Lord, the vessel cleansed by precious blood. Thou would now single me out for that anointing from heaven, that endowment of power from on high. Give to me that which I do not naturally possess and that is, O God, that infilling of the Spirit of the living God. It is the promise of the Father, the gift of the Spirit given to them that obey thee, given to them that ask of thee. And I pray now in Jesus' precious name, leave me not to myself, leave me not alone. Grant, Lord, you will put thy Spirit upon me. Give to me now, I beseech thee, the infilling of the Spirit of the living God with wisdom and with power. And Father, in answer now to prayer, be pleased to glorify thy dear Son in the salvation of the lost, the rest 
restoration of the backslider, the reviving and edification of the church, and Father, the glorifying of thy Son's dear and precious name, and the people of God said, Amen. You know the text before us tonight in John chapter 7, verses 37 and 8, uh, contains what I believe one of the most powerful sayings of Christ that's ever found in your Bible. I believe it deserves to be printed in letters of gold. I know that God preserves his word. I know that these words will be preserved for all eternity. We can even read this invitation when we get to heaven for the word of the Lord will never be broken and it will never ever be done away with. His word is everlasting. It's as eternal as the one who gave it. But if we were to highlight and if we were to say in heaven, we could place some letters of gold, some words of Christ, and they're all precious. Surely this would be one of those great texts that literally deserves to be printed and preserved in letters of gold now, in order to see the full force and the beauty of these words and this invitation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must remember the place where he spoke those words. We must remember the occasion upon which he uttered those words. And we must remember the time when they were spoken to the multitude. The place then was Jerusalem, the center of religious duty and ceremony and teaching in Israel. Jerusalem was the capital. We heard about that when David took Jerusalem from the Jebusites whenever he was first crowned king in Hebron and made his capital until the Lord returns at Jerusalem as the city of David and Zion, the city of God. The place was Jerusalem, the very hub of religious activity. It was there they had the teaching priest. It was there they had the scribe who expounded the laws of God. It was there they had the doctors doctors and lawyers of that law. You remember the Lord when he was in Jerusalem in Luke chapter 2. He sat with those doctors at 12 years of age. And he astounded them as he expounded the Old Testament and the rites and rituals. And how they would point to himself. And they were astonished. Where had such a young boy have such learning of the scriptures? You see, Jerusalem was the religious center. You would imagine if you went to Jerusalem, you would hear the truth. If you went to Jerusalem, you would find God. If you went to Jerusalem, at least the priest would be able to point you to the Lord. You would leave that city at least knowing you have met with God and God has met with you. It was the place of spiritual learning, religious instruction for the entire nation of the Jews. The place was Jerusalem, and it's important. That's where these words were spoken. The occasion was remarkable. It was at what is known as the Feast of Tabernacles. Very remarkably because this was one of the great feasts in Israel. There are at least three great feasts, as they're called. There are many, many other feasts in Israel, many others by tradition. We know that the book of Esther brings in the Feast of Purim. We know that others, but three main feasts in Israel... The Passover, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths. Uh, we have it in our authorized version as Tabernacles. Literally, it was the third, and it was the final feast of the year. It marked the end of the working year for the Jew in Israel. Remember that. It marked the end of the working year in the land of Israel. Out of all those feasts, you would imagine that the day of atonement would be one that has the biggest attendance. Or you might even say the feast of Passover. Surely Passover would draw the biggest crowd. Can I tell you that it was this feast, the feast of tabernacles, the feast of booths, when they remembered that they were strangers in the wilderness and they had no dwelling place to live in. And God commanded them to live in booths when they came out of the land of Egypt. And God says, you will remember. You will remember that I provided for you in the wilderness. And you will come. And three times a year at least, every male Jew, even a child, every male Jew was expected to make their way, no matter where they were, to the land of Israel, to Jerusalem, for those three main feasts. And the biggest crowd that ever gathered in the year 
to celebrate those feasts was on the Feast of Tabernacles. You'll remember in in the Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, they were gathering for the Feast of Tabernacles. They were gathering because they were remembering the feast. And here's the remarkable thing. The Bible tells us that there were nations outside of Israel and Jews were scattered. And those Jews made their way to Jerusalem for that feast. And the occasion was the Feast of Tabernacles. There was a lot of theater added to the feast that was not scriptural. A lot of it was nonsensical. A lot of it was just custom and just the notions of men. A lot of it was tomfoolery. And one of those notions they had was that they, at the end of the feast, it wasn't commanded in Scripture. It was at that feast that they decided they would take a bowl or even a bucket or a basin. And they would head down en masse to the pool of Siloam. And there one of the priests would fill that bucket full of water. And they would bring it to the temple. And then they would go toward the altar. And they would lift it up to God. And then ceremonially they would pour out the water. Just as if the water had come from the rock in the wilderness. And then that was a signal for everyone to go home. That was a signal that the feast was over. For it says the last day. The great day of the feast. And the moment that water was poured out beside the altar, that exact moment, and for those seven days of that feast, Christ was in the temple. He was sitting and he was speaking and he was teaching during the feast day. But on this occasion, the Bible says he stood. Most teachers in scripture, most of those Pharisees all sat to teach. But Christ stood. Because these people were now making their way out of the temple. Hundreds of them, thousands of them were making their way out of the city of Jerusalem. And the priest had just emptied the water beside the altar on the ground, a signal for everyone now to go home. The feast was over. It was theatrical. It was unscriptural. It was a custom, a tradition. It was nonsensical. It meant nothing. It wasn't even commanded by God. But at that precise moment that that water hit the earth, Christ stood up. I don't believe he was in the inner court At this occasion, I believe he came into the outer court. And therefore his words would have been heard because there would have been a silence. The priest lifted up the basin and he poured out the water. You could hear the flow on the ground. And then the shuffle of feet. And before they took a single step, the Lord stood on that occasion. And he cried, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He would make sure that they would leave the city of Jerusalem with those words ringing in their ear. If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. It's a remarkable statement. The time was the last day. This was the last time that the Lord perhaps would ever see any of these individuals again. It was the last day. The next feast was six months, round about springtime, the Passover. That would be the next one when multitudes like that would gather in Israel and at the city of Jerusalem. And the Lord may never see them again. Some of them will be in their graves. Some of them may be in a lost eternity. And this was the last, the very final invitation. If any man thirst, the last opportunity. If any man thirst, let him come to me. The last and final call. And let him come to me and drink. Because you may never get another opportunity. This will be you leaving Jerusalem unsatisfied. The thirst that you came to the city with was not found in rite or ritual. The thirst for God that God had created in your soul was not satisfied through the teaching priest or the Pharisee or the Sadducee or the doctor or the lawyer. You didn't find anything in the pouring out of water on the ground. And if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. At that crucial moment, Christ saw the hearts of those people. They were leaving the religious center of Israel unsatisfied 
They were leaving the very seat of learning in the nation, thirsting still for God, having found nothing to quench their spiritual thirst created by God and the rites and rituals, even at the Feast of Tabernacles. I want to tell you barren ceremony, pompous ritual, and custom and tradition that they added to all of these things left them with a void of eternal peace and perpetual joy in the Lord. They had come to Jerusalem and the great feast thirsting for God and they didn't find him except for Christ on the last day when he stood and cried to those that were leaving. If any man thirst... Let him come unto me and drink. Christ saw and pitied and cried out to them with the last invitation to come to him, to the unsatisfied multitudes around him and to all who come after. Christ is still speaking to those who are unsatisfied with religion and the church and rightly so, for it cannot save. It's only a channel, a mouthpiece, and a vehicle to preach Christ and the cross. To those that are disappointed with dead formalism and are longing for reality in their lives. To those whose hearts God has placed a desire for true happiness. To any who are living without the sense of peace with God, who are longing for the satisfying drink of the waters of life. Christ says to you, come unto me. What an invitation. What a beautiful call there is in the gospel. I want us to look at this invitation as we close out the gospel meeting. And I want you to think of Christ's invitation to the thirsty soul. I want you to think first of all, of the solemnity of this invitation. Notice in verse 37 it says, in the last day. That's important. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried. The word means literally to holler. It means to shout. He wasn't mumbling. He wasn't working at a mic, one, two, is it on, one, two. He wasn't, as it were, talking with his arm in front of him. Or he wasn't facing a wall. The Lord Jesus came into the open air. And he used it as an amphitheater. And his voice would have reverberated off the walls and the temple courts. And when he spoke, there was silence. And everyone turned. They were looking at the priest. He poured the water out. They were staring, waiting for the first one to move. And when one suddenly moved and turned around, Christ was standing there. And he shouts, come unto me and drink. And this was the last day of the feast. I said to you, it'll be half a year before most of these people, if they ever got the opportunity to return again, to Jerusalem. The people would be traveling back to their homes and this would be the final invitation they would hear or receive from the lips of the Savior. Christ will give them one more opportunity and if they will hear, they shall live. But if they refuse and reject, they shall die in their sin and where Jesus is heaven, they will never be. One more time. One last opportunity, one final call, one more invitation. Some received it. If you read verse 40 and part of verse 41, some rejected it, part of verse 41 as well. Some received it there and then. Some rejected it and left Jerusalem rejecting the Lord, I believe, for the last time. And I want to tell you something. The gospel invitation is always a very solemn one. And that's why we should press home. We should press home on the conscience of individuals tonight. For we do not know if you will be here tomorrow. And if tomorrow morning, or even through the early hours of the morning, we get a text or a word from someone in the congregation to say, did you hear the news? Such and such has passed away. I got that text just recently. I was at a funeral. I left the funeral. And a man texted me 
or sorry, phoned me and he says, did you hear the news? And I said, no. And he mentioned the man's name, Isaac Banks. And he says, Isaac Banks has passed away. We were shocked. Couldn't believe it. We were attending a funeral. Some of us still have on our phones text messages from Isaac. Every single day, some in this congregation, you got the text and the word and the little cartoon and the video. Sorry, Isaac, some of them were close to the knuckle. We didn't open them. I didn't read them. But I want to tell you, what a shock. But what if we got that? I personally got a flavor of that at the testimony night. When one young person sitting in this house, the next day could have been in God's eternity. Could have been in God's eternity. And friends, listen to me. I can live, I really can. I can live with a bit of criticism that I extended the meeting by giving the invitation. I can live with that, but I couldn't die if I didn't do it. But I want to tell you something. This could be it, my friend, if you but knew. Someday you will hear God's final call to you. I remember being in Lurgan Free Presbyterian Church. I think it was a gospel mission my wife would be able to. She has a tremendous memory, by the way. She never forgets a thing. So I never fall out with her. Uh, but she, she'll remember this. A man sitting in Lurgan Free Church, and I think it was a gospel mission. He sat there, and that very hymn was sung. Someday you'll hear God's final call to you to take his offer of salvation true. This could be it, my friend, if you but knew. God's final call. God's final call. Oh, hear his call. Oh, hear his call. God's final call. I want to tell you, uh, that man that night, he got right with God. And the more we thought about it, when he was sitting there and looking at him, we said to ourselves, this is it, God speaking to this man. God's final call. Can I tell you, on the, thir on the 31st of July, Hope I've got that right. There's 31 days in July. The 31st of July, 1983. My brother David in the Mays prison. He went to bed that night after a prisoner had witnessed to him and I had witnessed to him. And he went to bed that night and one prisoner said to him, you know, David, you need to get saved and you need to get saved now. This is the night that you need to get saved. I think it was a Sunday evening. He shared a cell with four other men. It was called the... the, the, the I'm just forgetting the name of it now, but it was one with four bunks and we only one with one bunk and two bunks. And it was the, the larger dorm, the, the big dorm they called it. And he went in there and those words were ringing in his ears. And one man said to him, David, this is the night you need to get saved. Those men were smoking, cursing, listening to the, the radio, telling jokes, laughing. And David was concerned, lying in the top bunk. In his testimony, he says this. He opened his Bible he wasn't ashamed to do it, although he was afraid. He opened his Bible, and he didn't know where to read, and he just opened it at Genesis, and he read chapter 6, and he got to verse 3. My spirit shall not always strive with man, and he closed the book. And then the voice kept ringing in his ear, this night, David, you need to get saved. This is it, David, this is the night you need to get saved. My spirit shall not always strive with man. Now, he wanted to get off that bunk, he tells he wanted to get on his knees beside his bed and he wanted to ask the Lord Jesus Christ into his heart for he thought that's what he needed to do. That's what you have to do. He didn't realize no matter where you are, should you be hanging upside down and we hope it doesn't happen to you. You can call on the name of the Lord. But he was afraid that those men would stop him and he didn't know what to do. And he just called out, lying on his bunk, he just called out to the Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ saved him. And if you listen to his testimony, he always says that night, that night, if I did not respond to the call of God, the Lord would stop striving with me. The Lord would leave me alone. The Lord would never call me again. And he believed in all his heart that that was the final night. And who knows, this could be it. The last day of the great feast, Jesus stood and cried. Let me say, I don't know. Is it the last Sunday of your life? Is it the last Sabbath evening? That you will be in the house of God. I don't know. Jesus now stands in our midst. And he cries. 
If any man, it's a generic term, male or female, young or old, rich or poor, if anyone, if anyone thirsts, thirsts for peace with God, pardon for sin, everlasting life, joy and happiness and eternal life in heaven, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me, come to me and drink. It's a final invitation. That's why, sinner, we say to you, turn tonight while the Savior in mercy is calling and steer for the harbor bright. For how do you know but your soul may be drifting over the harbor tonight? Behold now the accepted time. Behold now the day of salvation. Not only do we see the solemnity in this invitation, notice secondly, I want you to think of the scope of this invitation. If any man, now we can't argue with the Bible, whether you're a Calvinist, Arminian, or hyper-Calvinist for that, we cannot argue with the Bible. The Bible tells me, if any man, and these are the words of the Son of God, if anyone, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. The Lord will not cast a single sinner out who ever comes to him. He will not chase away. He will not put to the side he will welcome, receive, pardon, forgive, cleanse, save any man or woman who thirsts. And that thirst, we believe, is put there by the Spirit of the living God. There's no class distinction, for the invitation is open to all. It's what is known as the free offer of the gospel. My business and my responsibility as a minister of Christ and the gospel is to preach the gospel to every creature. God's business is to save, not mine. And I will leave God to his business, and God will leave me to mine. And therefore, I exhort you with the words of Christ, whosoever will may come. In our church in Lisbon, when they were building that new building, they were talking about various texts of Scripture. It has actually 42 texts of Scripture. Now, if my mate who does listen to these messages, picks this up. He'll be phoning me tomorrow and saying, you've got the number wrong. There are so many. How long were you in that church? I think there were 42, maybe 43, Bible verses right across the church. But there's one. There's one, I'll tell you, we were all agreed on, just above the pulpit. And it's the last invitation of the Bible. Revelation 22, 17. Whosoever will may take of the water of life freely. Whosoever will. It's a beautiful term. It's what is known as the free offer. There's no class distinction here. The rich and poor may come to Christ and take freely of the salvation that he offers and purchase on the cross for repentant sinners. There's no color distinction here. I mean there's no black or white. No salvation as the British Israelite thinks. For white people and all black people are cursed. That's what the British Israelite believes. Any person, they say, dying in the First or Second World Wars, fighting for Britain or America, the so-called lost tribes of Israel, it's nonsense, utter nonsense. They immediately go to heaven. So heaven without conversion, heaven without new birth. How wicked a doctrine that is. That's evil. That's a damnable lie. It has put many sinners in hell. There's no color distinction. There's no creed distinction. Catholic or Protestant may come. Jew or Gentile may come. Hindu or Muslim may come. All may come to drink from the water of the well of salvation. There's no condition too bad. It doesn't mention those who are better than others. Those who are a little more moral than others. It says any man. Anyone. So you name them, just name them now, you can come. Put yourself in there, you can come. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let him that is a thirst, that great text, let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. If you take the word come, children may come. See, children may come. Oh, and I know we're not being politically correct here. Old people will say Older people, just to keep myself right. Older people may come. C-O-M. Middle-aged people may come. E, 
everyone may come. It's a beautiful word. It's the Lord's favorite word in Scripture. It says, let him come. It's a beautiful word. I want to tell you God's salvation is for all types of sinners. And it's for you in this meeting house tonight. This man receiveth sinners. And whoever comes to Christ repenting of their sin and believing that he died on the cross, that he shed his blood and offered one great sacrifice to satisfy divine justice, to turn away divine wrath, and his blood would extinguish the guilt of every sin. If you come repenting and believing, I tell you, come and what a welcome. This man receiveth sinners. I tell you, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Because there's room at the cross for you. You notice what it says here. Not only the solemnity and the scope of the invitation. But I want you to notice thirdly. The subjects of this invitation. The subjects. Notice what it says. If any man thirst. If any man thirst. Here is the subject. Subjects of this invitation. If any man, woman, young person, boy or girl. Thirst. Let him come unto me and drink. I believe one of the most painful sensations which the body could ever experience is thirst. To have a thirst is bad enough. But not to have that thirst ever quenched is even worse. In hell, the Bible says that not even a drop of water is given to cool the tongue, for I'm in torments in this flame. The thirst can never be quenched. That's why I say to you, hell is not upon the earth. One wee second. I've done this before. Hell is not upon the earth. Because I can take a drink of water now. And if there's an ungodly sinner and a lost soul in this house, I can give you this glass. I'll turn it round so you're drinking from the clean end. And you can take a drink of water. I can even dip my tongue or my finger and take the water. Hell is not on earth. And we've heard clergymen this past while. And that's what they're preaching. That's what they're preaching. They're saying hell is on the earth. That's a lie. Hell is a real place and it burns as I speak. And I want to tell you my friend. That in hell. There's an eternal thirst that can never be quenched. But that thirst in your soul, that need for God and for grace and for salvation and for pardon and peace and everlasting life, that need that you have in your soul now can never be quenched by anything in this world or anything in the church or anything in yourself. The Lord Jesus says, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. And the water that I shall give him shall be as a spring of water springing up into eternal life in his soul. As the scripture saith, he's making reference, isn't he, to those verses in the book and the prophecy of Isaiah. Can I tell you a true story? Not that I would tell you a lie. Many, many years ago, many years ago, there was a sailing ship in South America. It was sailing the ocean. And because it had no engine, it could use some of its oars if the men were strong enough. But it used the wind to power the sail to get to their destination. Now, but good weather had come and no wind was blowing, which meant they were motionless on the ocean and sea. And for days and weeks, they just sat there going nowhere. And the fresh water that they had on board was gone. Nothing to drink. The story goes that they sat motionless like the boat on board, dying of thirst. Just dying of thirst. With the sun beaming down upon their heads. One man got up. He dropped the bucket into the sea in desperation. He lifted it out again and he drank. And to his amazement, he was drinking fresh water. He called the men and he says, it's fresh water. They hardly believe him. What they hadn't known was that that boat had drifted toward the mouth of the Amazon River where the fresh water and seawater come together. And literally it was like a vast lake. It looks like an ocean. 
but it's literally the mouth of the Abazin River. And when he dropped the bucket in, they were sitting amidst gallons upon gallons of fresh water. Now imagine sitting, perishing with thirst, dying with thirst, and all that water around you. What a fool you would be if you didn't drop the bucket in and draw from the fresh water of the Amazon River and drink to your fill, to your thirst is quenched. But I want to tell you there's an abundant supply of the water of life. And sinner, you are literally immersed in it tonight here in this house. You've had it in the messages in song. I believe you've had it in the congregational singing. No doubt you had it in the reading of scripture and I trust in the preaching of the word of God. And you are immersed with the river and water of life around you. And yet you perish. You perish for thirst. If any man thirst, the Holy Ghost creates soul thirst for God. The Holy Ghost brings conviction. I believe the Holy Ghost works on every single person in the world. I know people will say theologically, you're wrong, but I don't believe that for a moment. The Holy Ghost works on every single person in the world. He makes good and effectual the gospel to the elect. I believe that. But he seeks to give every man because they're responsible for to repent and believe before God. The Holy Ghost convicts. The Holy Ghost pricks the conscience. The Holy Ghost shows men and women their sin. You can meet people in the town of Cumber tonight and you say, do you know that you're a sinner? They say, do I know I'm a sinner? Of course I do. You're right, I do. You don't have to tell me that. Do you believe in God? Yes, I do. Do you believe there's a judgment day? Yes, and I know I'm not ready. People know that. Many who perish amidst that water of life and never drink from the well of salvation. I, I, I want to tell you, we didn't get to sing that verse, but that verse says in that great hymn we were singing, uh, I've tried the broken cisterns, Lord, but ah, their waters failed. Even as I stooped to drink, they fled and they mocked me as I wailed. Now to the soul whom God has given a thirst for pardon and peace with God, to the individual who is, I believe, placed within him by the Spirit of God, a longing and a thirsting for happiness and satisfaction and eternal life, this invitation is given. I want to tell you to the thirsty soul, there is the promise of living water. There is the promise of life, eternal life, life with a capital L, more abundant life in believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. The offer of life and peace and pardon is freely offered because Christ has come in the flesh. He has died. He has suffered. He has bled. He has paid the price. He's risen from the dead and now he stands in our midst just as the last day of the great feast and it could be the last night, an opportunity for you. And he says, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. I want you to think of the simplicity now of this invitation. Notice what it says, come unto me. How emphatic that is. In fact, if you look at this invitation, part of it is an invitation. And the rest of it is a command. If any man thirst, let. It doesn't mean somehow a lie. It literally means he must come to me. If any man thirst, here's the command. You must come to me. There's no mention of coming to the church in this text. No mention of the baptismal font in this text. No mention of the confirmation altar where you kneel before a bishop and he lays hands on your head and he can gives upon you the, what is known as the sevenfold grace of the Spirit of God through his hands. I've been there. And through that system. There's no mention of the Lord's table here. No mention come to the minister. No mention come to the pastor. No mention come to the priest. No mention to come to Mary. Or the saints. That have been canonized by the Roman Catholic Church. It says come unto me. Now did you get that? Neither is there salvation in any other. Come to me. I am the door. Come to me. I am the way. Come to me. I am the life. Come to me. You'll only be saved by coming to Christ. And I want to tell you, it's very personal, this invitation. Because while we know there's a general one, if any man, but it's very personal. 
It says, if any man thirst. That's very personal. And he's saying to you tonight, come to me. Come to me, sinner. That's what Christ is saying. He's here tonight. He just hasn't made himself visible. His arms are wide open. And he's inviting, calling, commanding. Sinner, come now to me. Come confessing your sin. Come calling upon my name for mercy. And come now. I you know what the Bible says, John 6 and 37. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You have the satisfaction in this invitation. Verse 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 38. Here's the satisfaction of this invitation. See, Christ has got something to offer. Christ comes not empty-handed. He doesn't knock the door of your heart tonight and stand there and knock without something wonderful to give you. He comes with a full salvation purchased by his own blood on the cross. The verse speak to us of abiding sense of peace that he will give to you. That's what it means to believe as the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the spirit of God who will bring life and joy and peace and pardon to the guilty soul as the spirit convicts of sin and brings the soul to Christ and that soul is converted by Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you'll have the Holy Ghost with you springing up into eternal life. It speaks of the river of rest from the fear of death, judgment and eternal eternal hell which will be ever flowing portion of all who know and love Christ. It's a supply of God's spirit uh, as a sinner and as a sea of sinner. It's the spirit's might and power working in and through you like a channel or oh, the satisfaction in the invitation. And then fin finally I want you to think of the spurning of this invitation. Notice what it says in verse 43. Look what it says in verse 43. And so there was a division among the people because of him. There was a division because of Christ. He gives the invitation and there's a division. And it's not Jew or Gentile. It's not rich and poor. I want to tell you it's a division of those who believed and those who did not. Because if you look with me at verse 40, look what it says there. Many of the people therefore when they heard this saying... That's 37 and 8. If any man thirst, let him come unto me. When they heard that saying, they said of a truth, this is the prophet. And then they went on in verse 41. Others said, this is the Christ. Isn't that remarkable? This is the prophet that should come. This is the Messiah. And they believed. But notice in verse 41, others said, but some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture 42 said that Christ cometh of the seed of David out of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division because of him. And there's a division tonight. Because there will be some who will respond to the gospel. They will either take Christ or they will turn from Christ. They will either choose Christ or refuse Christ. There'll be a division. The invitation was spurned. Many left Jerusalem unsatisfied and turned their backs on the greatest invitation to life and salvation that was ever given to mankind. They're like those sailors on the boat. They perished for thirst when the waters, fresh waters of life were all around them. What an awful thing to go to the eternal thirst of hell, knowing that you could have had that thirst quenched for all eternity. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, I want to thank thee tonight for the messages in song, the congregational singing, the offering of prayer, the reading of Holy Scripture the preaching forth of the everlasting gospel for this wonderful invitation. And yet the solemnity would be that this could be the last opportunity. This could be God's final call to sinners. 
young and old alike. They will never hear thy voice again. They will never have a single opportunity or an invitation given to them. And how important this night is. Tonight is the night they must be saved. We pray that they will come. For you've invited them. You've commanded them. And if they come and drink, they will never thirst again. Now, Father, bless thy word savingly. Bring souls to repentance and faith in Christ. Part us, thy people, in thy fear and favor. May we leave the house prayerfully and very carefully, pondering the things we have heard. And, Father, do be pleased to bless the gospel to the heart and souls of individuals, for we ask it in Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen.